Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation. The goal of the Sounds True Foundation is to provide access and eliminate financial barriers to transformational education and resources, such as teachings and trainings on mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion. If you'd like to learn more and join with us in our efforts, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, my guest is Susan Sands. Susan is a clinical psychologist known for her trailblazing work in female development and body-based disorders. She incorporates Buddhist philosophy and meditation into her work with patients, and she's also a journalist, publishing and presenting widely on the topic of eating disorders and body images, and now on the surprising pleasures of living in an aging body. She's also a core faculty member at the Psychoanalytic Institute of Northern California in San Francisco. With Sounds True, Susan Sands is the author of a new book. It's called The Inside Story, The Surprising Pleasures of Living in an Aging Body. At age 75, Susan has become an expert on something that's not often talked about, but as you'll hear in this conversation, it's so important to our well-being, and that's the power of interoceptive awareness or what could be called our body sense, our interior sense of our body. Measuring interoceptive awareness is something that's just really started appearing in the scientific literature over the past two decades. And yet practices, traditional practices, such as yoga and meditation, were actually designed to help us cultivate this type of inner knowing and inner intelligence. And according to Susan, this type of awareness, it's critical to our happiness as we age. Here's my conversation. It's a very deep, interesting conversation with Susan Sands. Susan, your new book is called The Inside Story. And right towards the beginning of the book, you write, The body sense is what I'm most interested in. The body that we feel and experience from within. So for people who are hearing this language, the body sense for the first time, can we start right there and can you help us have a feeling? What is the body sense? Sure. Um, It's really... uh, what we, what we can feel and sense when our attention is more in our body and away from this mind that's always going on and on and on and on. And I really believe that it's so important to have this sense of the body. It's grounding, it's stabilizing. It gets us away you know, from the monkey mind. Um, I'm using that word body sense, but the scientists are now using the term interoceptive awareness. In other words, awareness of all these signals, these sensory signals that are coming from all parts of the body. Um, And they're streaming up through the vagus nerve and, you know, up through the brain stem and up to this little point called the insula in our cortex that puts it all together, puts all those signals together to give us a sense of uh, the state of our body, how we're doing, the condition of our body, and we need that for our survival. But in doing this, it's also, this is so cool, it's so miraculous, that is providing our consciousness, uh, our emotional awareness, our sense of self. That's where it comes from. So it comes from these body sensations. 
And so just for, for shorthand, you know, I like to call it body sense. And one reason I like to call it the body sense some of the time is because I distinguish it from body image. And, you know, there's so much talk about body image in our society, which is really your, your visual picture of yourself. It's, it's how you see yourself in your mind's eye. Whereas the body sense is how you sense and feel yourself from within. So there's a lot here. Let's start with this notion of there's body sense, which I think I have a pun intended sense of body image. <laughs> I also have I also have a feeling for what that is. Is there something like also our actual body? Like here's the actual body. It's not how I'm sensing it. And it's not this idea I have that other people think I look a little fat or wrinkled or whatever. There's actually my body right here. W mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I, I certainly think we have a body and, <laughs> and I certainly think, you know, our actual body also affects how we think about it. Like, you know, people that, that have heavier bodies that research shows don't feel as good about themselves. They don't feel as good about their body image, for example. And, you know, how uh, and our temperament makes a difference too. how quick we are, how slow we are how our health, how, how good we feel, um, our emotional health, are we depressed, are we anxious? So all of this is going on all the time. And I should say there's, there's what's called extraception too, which is being aware of our body sensations, our external body sensations, not just internal. And we've also got proprioception, which is being aware of our bodies, how they as, as they move in space. So there's there's lots of stuff going on. But I'm focusing on this interoception because I think it's so important for well-being. And people haven't thought about it very much. And I, I that's that's part of why I called the book an inside story, because I think it suggests something that's hidden you know, that, that people should know about, and I want to let people in on it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I want to talk a lot more about interoception and how do we measure it and how do we develop it. But before we get there, I just want to clarify some things for myself and I think for our listeners as well. So if interoception is this tracking of my internal sensations, what's what you called exterior? Exception. Like, how am I able to know things if I'm not feeling it internally? Well, we have, and first I should say, Tammy, I am not a neuroscientist. So I'm no expert on this stuff. Um, you know, I'm a psychology, clinical psychologist doing psychotherapy in private practice. And um, so, you know, I have worked with the body and written professional articles on the body for years. But neuroscience is not my expertise. But, you know, there are all different kinds of receptors on the skin. Um, and, you know, we've got the pain and the cold and the warm receptors and pressure and all that stuff. So we're, we're, feeling, we're, we're feeling our skin. We're feeling the outside of our body. And we also have receptors like in our in our muscles and so forth, which help us uh, know where we are in space. You know, so and, and we know how to do things. Like if uh, somebody throws a baseball at us, we know how to get our hand there in time to catch it. So of course, there's a real body. Um, whatever real means, you know, I mean, all this is real, but yes, we have a flesh and blood body for sure. And you're distinguishing interoception, this felt sense within from mm -hmm. other perceptual capacities that we have. How would we measure our level of interoceptive awareness? Or could I say interoceptive intelligence even? Yeah, that's a good word. It's not used very much. 
um, there's interosec interoceptive accuracy. That's one of the uh, measures. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to measure. And what scientists have come up with is, um, is this measure of interoceptive accuracy, which mostly has to do with being able to be aware of our heartbeat. So what they do is they, <clears throat> they give you uh, a little heartbeat sound, and you have to say how close it is to your own heartbeat. Or they have you count the, the number of your own heartbeats in 30 seconds or something. So, but that's just your heartbeat. And, you know, there are now, after hundreds of different studies, there, there are lots of people that wonder if this really measures what we want it to. Um, but that's the main thing in scientific studies, or let's say neuroscientific studies. There's also questionnaire research, though. You know, there's a questionnaire study out of UCSF, uh, a, a questionnaire out of UCSF that's been used in a lot of studies, you know, that asks you questions about how you're doing. Um, would you like to hear some of those questions? Yeah, sure. There's this questionnaire called the Multidimensional Assessment of Interoceptive Awareness. It's called the MAIA. And it was developed by Wolf Mailing. And here's an example of the kind of thing that they ask. When I am tense, I notice where the tension is located in my body. So do you check that as something that you can do? Here's another one they ask you about. I notice when I'm uncomfortable in my body. I distract myself from sensations of discomfort. I am able to consciously focus on my body as a whole. I notice how my body changes when I get angry. I can use my breath to reduce tension. I listen to my body to inform me about what to do. Those are some examples. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that your focus in your book, The Inside Story, is on interoception because that's an area that you don't believe we've paid as much attention to as we could benefit from paying attention to. And, and my question is, why is interoceptive awareness so important to you? Why do you think it should be something that we all understand, know about, and cultivate? Well, I, I think it's because it's so good for our well-being. And there are so many studies that, that show that we feel better emotionally and physically when we have this capacity. And, you know, the, the meditation research and all, you know, the yoga research and all the related meditative practice research, they're all really about developing interoceptive awareness. The sense of our inside body rather than our outside body. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, we know after just hundreds of studies now on mindfulness meditation in particular, that, you know, it sharpens our attention. We're better able to focus. It regulates our emotions. It relieves depression and anxiety. You know, it's as good as medication for relieving depression and anxiety, even though I don't want anyone to go off their medication without speaking to their doctor first. Um, also, as you mentioned earlier, Tammy, there's more of a sense of presence, of being present you know, in the moment, of agency, of being able to take action on our needs and goals. There's greater empathy and compassion, happiness, better self other boundaries, and more stable, accurate body image. So, you know, what isn't helped by not increasing our interoceptive awareness? Hearing you say all that, it makes me think I'm surprised we haven't heard more about interoceptive awareness, listening to you uh, describe all of the benefits. Right. Um, well, you know, it's really only been studied seriously for the last two decades. 
there were some studies in the 90s. There was some there was some talk about it, just the beginnings of talk about it, like in the 1920s. But then there was a study by by Critchley, who really was able to show that the body sensations get mapped up in the insula, that something is really going on, where a lot of stuff in our body is being put on up there. It is put into that particular place in our brain, which really helps us regulate ourselves and which helps us have a sense of ourselves, a firm sense of ourselves and a better body image, a more accurate body image. And of course, all this is really good for aging mm -hmm. because you know our body image can suffer as we age. And that's one reason I think it's so important as I'm writing about aging to encourage developing this inside body sense for aging. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to uh, pull out something you said. You talked about how as we grow in interoceptive awareness, that we have more access to presence, which I think people mm -hmm. could probably have a, a sense of this connection to the present moment. But you also said that we grow in our agency, mm -hmm. our ability to bring about change. What's the connection between having a high level of interoceptive awareness and having access to agency? It's a very good question. And, you know, the neuroscientists can actually show where it's happening in the brain. Um, but what's amazing about interoceptive awareness is that when it goes, goes into the, um, the brainstem, it's actually by a very complicated mathematical process. It's turned into emotion. Emotion comes in. And the great thing about emotion is that it tells us whether the information streaming in is good or bad. It puts a value on it. So, you know, if some pain is coming from our left foot, uh, or pain sensations are coming from our left foot, it tells us, oh my God, you know, your foot has been crushed. Or it says, oh, you... Your foot is, is fine. You're just meditating. Just shift a little bit. So we really need that to know what to do. So it, it, you see the progression there, that it, it's going from sensation into emotion, which tells us what we need to do to ensure our survival or our happiness. We wouldn't know how to act on things if we didn't have this awareness coming through our bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, you also said, Susan, and, and I just want to make sure to really uh, make this very explicit for people, that this research in interoceptive awareness, it's really only been happening in the last couple of decades. And I think what you said is that yoga and meditation, these contemplative practices are actually designed to help us grow in interoceptive awareness. Can you explain that? How does yoga, how do meditation practices, mindfulness practice, how, how is that a cultivation method for interoceptive awareness? Well, let me first say, Tammy, that when they, these practices were developed, you know, thousands of years ago, uh, there was no thought, I would guess, of <laughs> signals streaming from all over our body. Um, but I'm sure that they knew that it was about, and of course all the teachings do from the Buddha. I mean, it's about moving down from the monkey mind into the body and finding stillness. And then really understanding more about the nature of reality being with what is, you know, all these things, all these wonderful benefits of these various practices in part come out of being aware of our body sensations. There's also, you know, 
many more spiritual kinds of explanations. And I feel those and I don't deny those. But what's so much easier to talk about now with this new research is that the body sensations themselves um, help us. Uh, and, you know, in yoga, we're, we're lying there on our mat and our teacher is really taking us maybe through a, a sweep of the body, starting with the toes and going up through every part of the body up, up to the head. Well, that's really getting you in touch with both internal and, of course, some external sensations, too. But I know my yoga teacher also talks about feeling inside the abdomen, feeling inside the heart and everything. So, um, you know, that, that, that we're definitely doing that. And in, 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 it's, it, it's pretty clear in yoga. And then in things like Tai Chi or Qigong, you know, you've also, you're also feeling the movement of the body. You're feeling the shift in balance and you're feeling the rotation and everything. And, and you're, so you're feeling all these different kinds of exceptions, you know, interoception and proprioception and, and exteroception. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, does it? It does. It does. Uh, I'm curious right now, if you were to give me a readout of your interoception awareness as a demonstration of how it works, what are you aware of? I'm very aware of my, <clears throat> my heart cavity. That's where I like to reside. Um, so I'm very aware of that. And I'm aware of how good it feels when I focus on that. Um, I'm also aware <clears throat> of some tension because I'm doing an interview with you and I don't know what you're going to ask about. Uh, and I can feel that, some of that in my chest. I can feel it a little bit in my neck. And I think it's the interior neck. And um, can also feel it in my legs. So all that is going on. And I am very aware of it. It's interesting that you ask because I realize I'm I'm not actually feeling so much in my brain. <laughs> you could say that's because I'm dissociated, but um, obviously I'm thinking, but it it feels like my attention is down in my body. Uh huh. Now, I know your background and work as a clinical psychologist, that you focused quite a bit on body issues. You've worked a lot with people that come to you because they have eating disorders. How has this work on interoceptive awareness informed how you work with people who are presenting something like an eating disorder? Well, I have always known um, that people with eating disorders have less, as, less of a sense of their body. They don't have a good sense of, of even what they look like. You know, if you think of people with anorexia, their body image is way off. They think of themselves as much heavier than they are. And, you know, they're usually, a, I mean, it's, it, it's so interesting to hear the, the, the almost delusional quality of how people feel about their bodies. And not just that, they also focus so much on appearance rather than what's going on inside. There's just incredible focus on appearance. And I think of one of my patients who always starts out the session because we're on Zoom talking about her hair and how terrible her hair is. And her, meanwhile, her hair, if there's every hair in place in this woman's hairdo. So, you know, I knew all this. And then when I started studying more about interoception, 
I realized a lot of what was missing in my patients. And I realized that one way to change that would be to encourage them to sink down in their body, right in the moment with me, to sink down and see if they could feel the inside of their bodies. And many can't, most can't, I would say. I also encourage, you know, meditation and yoga. And this patient I was talking about, uh, you know, just a minute ago, who thinks so much about her hair, she first started with meditation. She couldn't really tolerate doing meditation because the negative thoughts about herself and her body and her hair and everything just kept going through her head. And at first I said, well, yes, that's what meditation is. You know, we, we have our thoughts and then we try to let them go and so on. But I also suggested that she try yoga. Um, and that was much better for her. I, I think the same benefits of focusing in and being in the here, here and now were there. But it was also helping her get in touch with her body and grounding her. More. So that was the that was the thing for her. Uh, and then uh, you know many older people do best with the standing meditations because they don't have to get up and down off the floor, and they're wonderful. And there are Tai Chi classes, for example, that meet in parks in my town of Berkeley. And when I was in China, I saw particularly older people doing these various well, martial arts and also Tai Chi and Qigong and so on. I saw them out there every morning in the parks. There are all these older people. It's the most wonderful thing. They're there in their bare feet and they're doing these practices. And they're also walking on stones. And I didn't know what was going on years ago when I went to China. And I actually looked it up when I was doing the book. And it is a kind of walking meditation and it also uh, makes you have to adjust to the unevenness of the walking the of the stone path and that also gives you <clears throat> more of a sense of what's going on inside it also improves your balance it may actually be hitting some acupuncture points on the bottom of your feet. And they've been doing this forever in China. <laughs> mm -hmm. You write in the inside story, this is one of the one of the headlines. Interoceptive awareness is an ageism disruptor. Uh -huh. An ageism disruptor. Can you explain that? Um, yes, it's, it's good for countering the way we feel about our aging bodies because it's taking us inside our body where we don't have to think about wrinkles and sags and all that stuff. We can think about how our body is still, if it is healthy and strong, how, it, how it's still operating. Um, so, and then there's, there's also lots of research um, that the interoceptive awareness is actually uh, so good, in fact, a necessary condition according to some research, for accurate and stable body image. Um, so that in that sense, it's actually changing the picture we have our, of ourselves in our brain because we have all this information coming up from our body to tell us more about who we are. We're not just thinking of ourselves as how we look and how other people see we look. Help me understand this notion because I'm not quite clear on it. When you say an accurate and stable body image, what you mean by that? I mean, my my image of my body is changing all the time because my body is changing all the time. So help me understand this notion of a stable body image. 
Well, I don't mean stable over time, because that would be kind of crazy if we had right. the same body image at age three as we do at 73. So what I mean is it's, it's stable in the moment and from day to day. Some people, you know, that, that really have trouble with body image and with interoception, um, they, something goes wrong. You know, their, their boyfriend or their girlfriend says something to them they don't like. Well, there's this terrible change, not only in mood, but in how they feel about their bodies. Uh -huh. You know, suddenly they feel older, fatter, you know, weaker, stupider looking. I mean, all this stuff. So people get plunged into these, these terrible states um, when they're thinking only about appearance. But if you can ground yourself in your body and feel the pleasure of it, and there's such pleasure in being in your body, then it, it's wonderful for, for mood, for body image, everything. And it, it, it also gives you something to do if you're feeling bad about how you look. You're on your way to some party or interview or something or other, and you're worried about how you're looking, and you catch yourself right then to just sink down in your body or do some meditation. It really changes how we feel about ourselves. How we, it changes how we feel in ourselves and about ourselves. Let's talk about that pleasure of the inner body, to use that phrase uh, for a moment, and how you experience that. You mentioned that you often keep your attention centered to some degree in your heart cavity. What, what's the pleasurable feeling that you're able to connect with there? I'm not even sure I can describe the why of it. Um, I mean, I think just being inside is more grounding. And then, of course, however we think about our heart, <laughs> you know, it is just an organ, but we also think of it as the organ of love and compassion and so on. And so there can be a kind of a, a, a welling up of heart feelings. And I'm using that metaphorically, the term heart feelings, uh, when we're in our body which of course you know expands us into the world we're not so alone we're feeling compassion we're feeling empathy we're feeling more connected to other people and uh that's the best thing for us connected to other people connected to the natural world connected to everything now, you know, I was asking you, uh, Susan, about your work with people with eating disorders, and you mentioned how often someone with an eating disorder will have a distorted body image, a distorted sense, mm -hmm. and that the more we can develop our interoceptive awareness, the more we have available to us an more accurate body image. And I think the question that comes up for me when it comes to body image is, I don't even know how to think about it. I mean, it's so informed by cultural views and other people's perceptions. It's an image. Do you know what I mean? Like I, yeah. I'm understanding what it means to feel inside myself, but I don't, I don't even know what an accurate body image is. It depends what century I'm, I'm living <laughs> in based on what people view as, you know, sexy at the time. So what's, what's your view of that? Well, I mean, you've got it. <laughs> body image is, is always, it's always changing. And it's very different what century you're in or whether you're in a Midwestern rural town or, you know, or you're in New York. So when I say 
uh, accurate or stable, but, you know, it, it only has to do with accurate or stable depending on who we are and the context we're in. Um, but this inner body, I haven't thought of this before, but I don't think the inner body has changed very much over the centuries. In other words, I would guess that people who are in touch with their internal body sensations felt kind of the same thing, you know, back in the, the, the Buddhist time as they do now. So that's another thing. And, you know, let me just mention another piece of research which shows that um, the more internal awareness you have, the less you're influenced by external stimuli. So that is a wonderful way of resisting this visual brainwashing of our current society. We're not going to be so influenced by all those media images that are bombarding us <laughs> morning until night from this aging industrial complex, you know, it's trying to sell us products. So, you know, as I said, it's, it, it's kind of good for everything, it seems to me, to be more in our body. What a good question, though, Tammy. Mm -hmm. Well, and as someone who's done a lot of work with people with eating disorders, did you find in your experience, and is there research on this, that as people develop greater interoceptive awareness, their uh, eating disorders recede? Is Absolutely. there a direct relationship there? Absolutely. There, there's good research on this. The Olga Palatos in, in Germany, you know, in particular. Um, so it, it does actually, uh, of course, you know, it, it changes eating disorders because it gives us a more accurate sense of our body. Not only an accurate, you know, not only an accurate picture of our body, but also um, when, when we're hungry, for example. I've been talking about anorexia, but let's talk about people that are compulsive overeaters. They don't really have a sense, many of them, when they're full, when they should stop. And so having this internal awareness is telling us what's going on in our bodies and what we need or don't need. So in that sense, eating disorders, you know, it, it's just really one of the addictions. It's also very good for people with all kinds of addictive disorders. Because if you can calm your body, you don't need the self-soothing of the addiction as much. And also you understand more about how bad that addiction is for you for your body, for your mind. Now, you, you mentioned the bodily pleasure that can come with increasing our interoceptive awareness. And particularly, you seem to reference this as we age, that as we age, it's possible that we could feel more and more pleasure inside our body, despite, you know, the misery myths we're told about, you know, how terrible being in an aging body is going to be. And I wonder if you can speak to that, but also let's not pussyfoot around. Uh, and what mm -hmm. I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people are like, look, you know, I'm getting older and older and I have more aches and pains and I have, you know, concerns about memory loss. And now here I'm listening to some podcast about these increasing pleasures in the body as we age. And, <laughs> you know, I have some real questions about that. So let's address that person as well. Sure. Well, and I'm one of those people, you know, I'm 75 years old. I can feel change. I can feel brain changes. And I can feel changes in my balance and stuff. I'm in pretty good shape, you know, because I, I exercise and I meditate and all that stuff. And I'm just lucky in terms of my, my genes. But it's hard to age. It's it's hard to uh, feel weaker, and to see our, you know, our our, our appearance changing. 
it's very hard. Um, so um, now I'm forgetting what the rest of your question was. Oh, yeah. And so things actually happen to us in our bodies and in our brains that make it easier to age. Um, and one of the things is that we get more happy. Um, and it's called the positivity bias by Karstensen, Laura Karstensen, who's a big guru of aging at Stanford. And what, uh, what that means is that given a situation, as we get older, we're more likely to take a positive slant on it. And, you know, the, the researchers will show people pictures, for example. And then later, they'll ask what those pictures were about. And the people that are older tend to give a more positive rendition of those pictures. And people feel that it has to do with a different sense of time. You know, that we know there's less time ahead of us. Time is limited. So we, we savor the time that we have left. And we focus more on the positive. And uh, there can be a startling sense of present time. And this one author, um, uh, Daniel Quinidos, talks about it as small seconds of eternity, where you're suddenly caught in the moment. And it seems like the moment will last forever. And I, I also think of that as a, 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 a moment of bliss. And so some of this, this greater mellowness and happiness, you know, comes from this different sense of time. And then there are these other brain changes and body changes, like interoception, <laughs> you may be surprised to learn, actually declines with age. But our perception of our inner sensations is more complex. And we can do more with those sensations, as one of the experts told me. Um, and it leaves our body less reactive if we have less interoception. We don't well, feel what, it. what does that mean we can do more with those perceptions? Well, really what I was saying that, you know, we know that if we um, perceive that look on our partner's face, um, we know more what to do with that, how to right. interpret it and then what to do with it. You know, we don't have to freak out inside necessarily. We can just think, oh God, he's, he or she is, is really upset about something. And I'm not gonna shout back. I'm just gonna give him a, a stare, say nothing and move on. You know, in other words, we've learned more about how to interpret and handle situations. But there's these other brain changes too. Um, our amygdala, which is you know, the part of our limbic system, which uh, deals with our emotions particularly, and, and also, also creates and, and deals with, manages our emotions, particularly our negative emotions. And that gets weaker. The amygdala gets weaker as we age. So we're not as affected by negative stimuli, which is kind of a cool change. And then also there's other studies that show that we can actually take more cognitive, higher brain control um, of things that are going on. And we can kind of take something that feels worrisome and we can sort of throw it into the prefrontal cortex and organize it and think about it. So what I'm saying is this makes the, all this makes the body quieter inside along with you know being over the the tumult of, of our hormonal shifts every month. All this makes the body sort of quieter and a little slower inside. 
that there's a little more space in there. And I'm putting forth that I think that we're actually primed by all these changes to sense and feel our bodies more deeply and pleasurably. And we're primed to be able to live in our body more. In other words, to be more embodied. And I think some people only become embodied in older age. And I say this from my personal experience. I feel like I've been able to shift down into my body much more as I, as I get older. And I'm finding that's continuing to happen. And I think it's a combination, you know, of, of putting my attention there and knowing the research, but it's also something that's just plain old happening inside me. And I, I hear it from my friends and my, you know, I interviewed almost 30 people for the book and uh, they said kind of the same stuff that they're less anxious, they feel more like themselves. And even though we have more sags and creaks and falling of the flesh and, you know, God forbid, uh, serious illnesses and disabilities, dementia and so forth, that people are taking, are able to take more of an is what it is mentality. Uh, this kind of Buddhist notion of just be with what is. Uh, so I think all this can actually increase our experience uh, as we get older. And it can be a great life stage, you know, of increased openness and acceptance and happiness. That's the surprise. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know as I was reading the inside story, and I got to the section about the positivity bias and how we can be more positive as we age. I exclaimed this out loud to my partner and she was like, thank goodness you're going to get more positive <laughs> with age. You need the positivity bias as someone <laughs> who has a very uh, hyperactive amygdala and uh, a habit of always seeing what's wrong in any mm -hmm. situation. I was so happy to, <laughs> to read this. Now, one of the things that at first I felt confused, and I think I'm still, to be honest with you, Susan, trying to process it, is this notion that our interoceptive powers actually lessen as we age. And yet we have available to us this greater sense of well-being. And it made me think that maybe interoceptive awareness, there's so much happening that it can be overwhelming. And that maybe we're better able to metabolize all of this information coming from the inside story if there's not so much information. And I wonder what you think <laughs> about that. I, have, you know, I think it's a great idea, Tammy. You know that we, we're we're not as over we're not as overwhelmed by our emotions. Uh, the emotion research does suggest that. That, you know, that as we age and we have these various changes in our body and brain, you know, the physiological ones I was just mentioning, that our emotions uh, get more positive and not so, not so strong. So we can feel happier. And, uh, and we can stay in our bodies more if it's more if it's more comfortable in there it's more manageable yeah it's more re it's more reasonable yeah <laughs> or you know we can deal with it now one of the other things that you write about as we age we're able to experience more mixed emotions for example happiness and sadness at the same time and i've also had had that experience and i'm wondering what your view is is why is that more available to us or for some of us as we age you know, I would, I would say this is really a part of wisdom, and I, I don't really know. Um, I mean, we're getting we're getting our emotions just as we always have. I think again, it's it's what we do with them. 
And having lived on the planet for a longer amount of time, we can see that even though we're having a really hard time right now, for example, we're growing, we're strengthening ourselves. There's light at the end of the tunnel. Things always change. You know, there's all this wisdom that we have that I think makes it easier to hold both the positive and the negative at the same time. On the other hand, we also, if something really great happens to us, we don't think, ah, this is the break. You know, I got all these, all these hits on the internet. Now I'm off and running. You know, we can say, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? It feels good right now, but you know, everything changes. So, you know, I'm such a Buddhist at heart, and um, I, uh, I come back to this everything changes idea of Buddhism, the idea of impermanence, that everything comes into being and then falls away. And not just physical things, but, you know, our emotions, our sense of how we feel about ourselves. All these things are they're constantly changing. Mm-hmm. Now, in the inside story, you point out, and this kind of goes along with what we're talking about with this positivity bias as we age, that there's actually research that shows that for many people, our elder years are actually the happiest times Mm -hmm. of our lives. What what is that research? It's really true because I think we have an idea that, you know, old people uh, often experience themselves as lonely and irrelevant. The idea that this could be the happiest time of our lives, really? Yeah. Well, all the aging experts talk about it. And there's, as you probably are aware, there is this very well-known book called The Happiness Curve, sometimes called The U-Bend of Happiness, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which uh, you know summarized lots and lots of different research on happiness of you know, research on thousands of people. And the curve, you know, it it starts, or let's say that, let me put it this way, Uh, the unhappy, if we see it as an unhappiness curve, uh, we start out happiest in our younger years. And this is, you know, barring terrible abuse or whatever. And then our, our unhappiness rises slowly, and it peaks in middle age. And I think particularly for women, because of uh, perimenopause. But there are some studies that show that 47 is our least happy year. And here we're supposed to be at the prime of our lives. You know, and maybe the kids have left home and we're at the peak of our career. Well... We're more overwhelmed, our hormones are more overwhelming, and we're not as happy. And then the curve starts declining again and shows that we're the happiest in our older years, starting in our late 60s, early 70s, with the age of 82 being our happiest year. Crazy, huh? And um, then all the Karstensen research, also on the positivity bias, shows the same thing. And she's done this research where people actually carry beepers and uh, they're they're beeped uh, several times a day and and they say how happy they are at that moment. So she's had people of all different age groups carry beepers and finds that as people get older, they do get happier. And this is even true for say the 20 year olds. She measures them for 10 years and even the 20 year olds get slightly happier over that 10 year period. So there is really something about this. And it's a, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, it helps us of course, face mortality too, to uh, to be able to 
feel more happy about things in our older years as things are winding down. Yeah, help me understand. Like, so I get you're 75 and mm-hmm. your happiest age uh, research wise could be yet ahead of you at age <laughs> 82. So your happiest days are yet ahead of you. But how does that help you feel positive about dying? I think it's not, uh, I mean, it's an acceptance. As we get older, we feel more accepting of ourselves if we're lucky. Not everyone does. I mean, they're grouchy older people. And they're people that that have, you know, terrible disabilities, too. Um. But it's this greater acceptance of of how things are that I think helps us face our mortality. Um, I, you know, I talk in my book about these different narratives we have that we're supposed to triumph over these various things, like supposed to triumph over our body and our society by doing a thousand things and not sleeping enough and so on. And then, you know, that becomes the triumphing over the aging body narrative. We ought to just be able to beat aging. We ought to be able to defeat it. And there are books with these titles. And it's, it's all over the media. And then, you know, that, as we get older, uh, it's also, we've got to triumph over death. We have to live longer. We've got to increase our longevity. There's so many articles on this. And uh, so I'm encouraging us, you know, to try to, uh, to, to fight these aging negative uh, the, the narratives. Um, and, there, you know, there are various ways of doing it. Uh, one is to dump this image of aging as an arc, uh, you know, where we rise up to our peak in our middle years, and then we drop down on the other side. Uh, As we just found out, the happiness curve goes in the other direction. And if we could think of the aging process as like an upward spiral with these different trajectories out, uh, if we could see aging as fulfillment or as culmination, what an idea rather than decline and we can we can work to rewrite these ageist narratives that is a very uh, powerful re-imaging of uh, upward spirals and moving out versus this aging as decline that's that's very powerful i realize i've internalized a view of aging as decline and that that's something I really need to question. It's powerful, yeah. Susan. Yeah. Now, one of the things you write about in this notion of introceptive awareness as an aging disruptor, ageism disruptor, is how at this time, and this is the note I'd like to end our conversation on, you believe we actually need a movement to counter ageism in the same way or a similar way that we've said, we need to counter sexism in our society. No, it's not okay. These are ideas that we've taken on, that we've taken on from patriarchal constructs. No, we're gonna counter sexism or something like racism even, that this has been sort of built in to our structural notions of our world and ageism as well. And I'm curious if you were to say, here's what I think the keys are to counter ageism. If we were to have a movement, what would it focus on? Because no, we're not going to just sit idly by and see an ageist culture be perpetuated and participate in it. Right. We haven't addressed age inequality even though we've addressed all the other, or tried to address the other inequalities. So, I I mean, I think the first step is to really understand how ageism, um, how, how it works in our society. And we've got to see the, the aging stereotypes. 
uh, you know, that were, were dumber, were slower, were less interesting. Uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, the ageism is really something. And we've got to try to recognize and, and ferret out those uh, negative age stereotypes, because that's what they are. And we have to, to look at our own ageism. I mean, that's, that's really the problem. Um, do we lie about our age? Do we assume young people find us boring? Uh, you know, these stereotypes begin in childhood and they come through our family and culture, particularly how, if, if we're women, how our mother thinks of her aging. And uh, so, I mean, I, I think that we, we first need to become really aware and then we need to start talking about it and writing about it. And as I said earlier, to, you know, to change this image of aging into an upward spiral, we can join age awareness groups. One of my friends leads them. Um, it's good to have intergenerational activities where the young and the old get to work together and really get to know each other. And corporations think it's also very helpful for their productivity. And um, then I think we have to stand up and offer our gifts, you know, our, our own gifts to the world. We have to uh, say, no, we're not, we're not over the hill. We've got more to offer, much more to offer. And uh, we have to get the respect that we deserve. And look at you, Susan, you're doing it here at age 75 writing this beautiful new book, The Inside Story, The Surprising Pleasures of Living in an Aging Body. It's a book that brings together a lot of research, neuroscience, as well as inner practices that help us develop our introceptive capacities and find more pleasure living from the inside out. It's a book I really enjoyed reading, and I really have enjoyed uh, talking with you and getting to know you. Susan. Thank you for your courageous work. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. I've really enjoyed the interview and I've felt pushed by you into new ways of thinking about all this. So thank you. Well, and I felt pushed by you and I'm going to embrace this upward spiral idea because I think it's so important to health and creativity and flourishing in our elder years. So thank you. I've been speaking with Susan Sands, author of the book, The Inside Story. Thanks for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at resources.soundstrue.com backslash podcast. That's resources.soundstrue.com slash podcast. If you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I absolutely love getting your feedback and being connected. Sounds true. Waking up the world. <laughs>